Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Anderson. I'm an equity strategist and marketing project manager here at Education Elements. And um, I feel most included when um, there is a demonstration of intention. So that could look like a lot of different things. That could mean, um, you know, calling on me to share. That could look like um, asking for my advice or for feedback on different things. But some action that connects to clear intention to incorporate me in whatever's happening. Thanks, Jess. Coming to you, Kim. Yeah, hi, I'm Kimberly. I'm a design principal um, based out of the Los Angeles area. Um, what you said, Jessica, really resonates with me as well. I think whenever my voice is mindfully brought into the conversation, I'm asked for feedback, my opinion is validated and um, brought into the conversation. I think that's when um, I feel most included. Awesome. Hi everyone, Crystal Shu joining you live from Atlanta, Georgia. And I would say I felt most included, similar to a lot of sentiments I see in the chat, um, is it's not necessarily about the topic of discussion, but when I walk into a room and I feel safe um, in a psychological and emotional way, um, meaning that I might not be the only voice, right? Like I might have a perspective and I know that there's others in the room that will, that might hold similar perspective. Um, and I won't feel like I am entering a space that I'm not sure what to expect. So keep on dropping into the chat of when you felt most included, because that is the conversation that we are hoping to have today. And so in our next uh, 57 minutes, we're hoping to sort of explore with you um, the top barriers that we've named in preventing equ equitable inclusion, right? So if one thing you take away, inclusion is not all the same. Uh, inclusion is not about being equal. Um, so we want to share some of the top barriers. The next aspect is we want to be able to rec start recognizing and sharing some detours. So even once you're creating that inclusive environment, you're bringing people into the room and you're bringing people into the conversation. Um, you can start spotting detours when the conversation is gearing off of an equitable inclusion lens, um, path, and um, environment. And then finally, um, we'll share some different types of inclusion, right? So inclusion isn't just about a focus group or a town hall. There are so many other ways of creating experiences, but, and also what are the best practices to honor and to prioritize as you craft that. Um, we are going to go through this pretty fast in the next hour, um, but the idea of all of this is anchored in our definition, our approach is how we think about educational equity. We're not going to read it to you, but we'll just share um, some of the key phrases of the words that resonate had, that have really resonated with um, the three of us, but also when we when we show this to our partners and our clients. Um, and it's that beyond recognition, it is naming that the barriers of marginalized students face are due to deliberate actions, right? And so as we think about inclusion, is how do we make sure that those deliberate actions are named, right? Are recognized, but also act actively mitigated against as we think about inclusive practices. Um, and that's what we mean by dedicate a greater amount of resources. So not about the uh, quality. It's not about, you know, everyone gets the same thing, but how do we create an inclusive environment that is actually actively fighting against the deliberate actions? Um, and you're like, you might be new to our series. You might be joining us for the first time and you might be old friends that have been with us for the last few months. Um, but in our methodology of how we uh, think about redesigning systems for equity within our school systems, we're currently in the include phase, right? So um, last, last month, uh, we did one around our inventory. We've also, uh, a few months ago, did one on connect. Um, this month, you're at include. Next month, we will be at create. And all of this is available to you through our inclusion guide. Um, so go on the Ed Elements uh, webpage and go ahead and download the guide um, after this conversation today, because the guide goes into a lot more details um, because you might be like, tell me more, give us more examples. You're going really fast. Um, that's intentionally because we can't really cover all the things in our guide, but just know that this is anchored in that. So let's go ahead and get started talking about include, equitable inclusion. Um, you've seen this. Uh, so this is from a great, um, I wish she was our colleague, uh, but she's a mentor to Jessica and she's someone who's done some internal training for us at Education Elements. Dorica Blackman once said, diversity is fact, inclusion is a strategy, belonging is a measure and equity is the goal. And one of the things that we've always been thinking about is that how, do, how is inclusion used as a strategy towards our goal of equity? Inclusion does not mean you've met your goal of equity. But true equitable inclusion is a strategy for you to be one step closer to understand belonging, 
to be able to actually measure belonging to, to ultimately get to the goal of equity, right? And so if you are hoping to get to a goal of equity, know that you have to really take a magnifying glass up against your inclusion strategy within your districts, within your schools, within yourself. And so the top question, I want to I want to see if this is resonating with people. So if you're like this is resonating, do a reaction, uh, put it in the chat. Um, questions we get a lot is uh, so we've been working on including the voices of insert the stakeholder of various districts, uh, schools, and communities, but we really aren't seeing progress. Right? Why is that? If people will say to us like we we hold town halls, right? We we make information available. We we try, we're trying, we wanna bring people, we invite people, we have these opportunities, but we're still just getting the same people coming or we're not hearing the voices we wanna hear or we're not hearing, you know, we're, we're not getting the information we want. Is this resonating with anybody? Uh, if it is, yes, Amy Hunt, thank you so much for like putting in like the exact stakeholder. Parents, yes. Um, Jessica and Kim, Raise the roof, you're like, this resonates with me. I mean, I hope it resonates. Yep, there you go, there you go. Um, so this is the top question that months and months ago, Jessica and Kim, when we first started thinking about inclusion, we were like, this is the question, let's dive in. And all of you guys are saying it, right? So you're, you're identifying a certain group that you're really not hearing from, and Amy's really identify a specific group within even the greater parents. So what we say to you is the engagement line so the engagement, the show up of your parents, the engagement of your parents or any stakeholder group um, is the line that fluctuates, that, re uh, that reveals your iceberg. Everything that you see that you could figure out, like they're not here or they're not uh, feeling included. However, we will hear like how, you know, they're not feeling their needs are met. Those are the things that we actively see, feel here, right? They're probably the ones that you I uh, hear from surveys, they're probably the ones that you know you're missing the voice. Those are the things above the iceberg. And a lot of you were able to identify it. Um, everything below the line is what some may feel, may hear, may see, but not the collective. And so exactly what Ruth is sharing, right? Um, be, I, she wrote, I think because of the upper management and able to get the funding, we're able to progress or the invitation on what we can do as an individual. So Ruth, maybe you see that, but maybe not everyone around you see that. So sometimes you might be in a space where you're like, this is why, and people are like, oh no, that's not why. That's not the reason. That's not what we feel here and see. And then you feel this tension of like, what am I, like, how do we move progress? That's how you think about it. The engagement line, what everyone sees and agree on is above. Everything that's below is that not the collective. And what we're saying today is that, yes, there is this great iceberg. Yes, these are all true. But everything that drives the exclusion system within um, schools, within districts, even within organizations, are the conditions that are invisible, that are actually causing it for people not to see it. It's making it okay for people to say collectively, like, hey, like, that's below the, like, that's, we don't even see that. And so if you really want to think about equitable inclusion, it is really thinking about what is causing exclusion, right? And we're really thinking about what are the conditions, invisible conditions often, that people can't explicitly name that is causing exclusion amongst groups. And so for that, the reason why for that is here's some of the challenges. You're here today. You're investing in your own learning. You saw this title and you're like, I want to be here with just Kim and Crystal at 1111 Eastern time, it's because you're probably like trying to lead or trying to do this work and you're trying to bring others along. Here are the four challenges you're probably feeling um, that are just invisible. They're not even invisible at this. They're conditions that are making it really hard to create an inclusive, uh, equitable inclusion. The first challenge is you're probably helping people translate equity from theory into practice. The number one thing we hear is like, we have a book study, right? But then like whatever comes out of the book study sometimes is really hard because it's difficult to transfer theory into practice if you don't have someone with you guiding that transfer of practice. And that challenge is because of the second challenge because we are highly susceptible to unaccounted bias, power, privilege, and conditions. 
So if I'm reading a book, but I haven't unpacked all my biases, my power, my privilege, my conditions, when I try to apply the learnings from the book, I need someone there to call me out and help me see the hidden blind spots. And if that structure isn't there, it's going to be a challenge towards equity because people will be taking action and they're like, I read it from this book. And then it's like, no, that may not be the intent of what the author wanted you to translate. The third challenge is it takes a really long time to show impact, right? Um, there are things that we will get like wins pretty quickly and you can see shifts, but big robust equity redesign will take time to show the impact and it also requires you to redefine the measure of impact. And just from the quote at the very beginning, we talked about how sense of belonging is a measurement towards how you're going towards your goal. How are you measuring belonging? And if that measurement of belonging is based on historical norms, but not the reality of the marginalized, then you're actually measuring your impact in a different way. And the last challenge is that um, solutions are really hard to scale and replicate, and they're very dependent on intersectionality of factors. Those things, even if it's within your same district, you could take a solution that happened on your team that you designed that created great results and put it in a different system or a different team, and it may not actually get the same. It may actually go a little backwards. And so the hardest thing we hear from people is like, give us a, like, what's worked? Tell us what's worked. And it's like, here's what's potentially worked, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work for you. So the process of scaling is going to take a little bit longer. So put in the chat, uh, which challenge resonates with you as someone who's investing in your learning um, that you're putting in. So put in the yellow, the green, the blue, or the red. Just put the color of the challenge that is super uh, resonating with you. And if you're like all of them, you could put all. But thank you so much for just putting it in. Love. I'm seeing a plethora of colors. I wish we could actually change the color of the chat bubble. Maybe Zoom will do that for us in the future. Um, Jess or Kim, what, what would you say are trends? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of yellows and blues. Um, I think that's great because we're going to talk a little bit um, about the practice and get really practical and tactical. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Um, but yeah, blue as well as, you know, it does take time to kind of really um, see the impact, but just uh, I'm excited to kind of talk a little bit more about that as well and um, how you can sort of mindfully plan for that. But excited to see that people are excited about addressing all of these different challenges in different ways. All right, and so I'll just talk for a minute about um, the purpose um, and outcome of INCLUDE. So um, really there are some key goals that we're trying to um, help you address here. So first is helping think through um, how you can proactively design for the inclusion process. So what does it look like to go um, you know, beyond the concept of having open invites to your community, but actually really finding ways to include and welcome uh, diverse voices in your community. So what can you do to sort of proactively invite those voices? Um, so that's one that we want to talk a little bit about. Then we also want to talk a bit about how you can um, both uh, recognize what some of the barriers might be and then proactively design your inclusion strategies to prevent those uh, hinder those hindrances and uh, barriers to um, inclusion. So we'll go a little bit into um, what are some of the practices when you're designing your inclusive spaces that can prevent those barriers as well. Um, and then lastly, what are different engagement strategies to consider? So Crystal, you've heard her use the word the room. So what does the room look like? What are the different types of rooms that exist? Um, and then what does it look like to design those rooms to both um, amplify and invite diverse voices? So we're going to talk a little bit about all of these um, different strategies. And then, you know, if you want to get into them a little bit deeper, we're going to talk if we can um, reference the include guide to get deeper into these strategies. But hopefully we'll give you a good overview during our time together here. So before we get into these different components, I just want to make sure that we clarify what we mean when we say the room. Um, this sort of proverbial room is in reference to a lot of the conversations we have about what it means to bring diverse um, voices to the table, right? Um, and so we're pushing the conversation forward to say, let's not only look at the table and the identities of its guests, but let's also consider the room in which the table sits, the experiences people have before they enter the room, right? 
as they move through the room or even after they depart the room. And so uh, the conversation today is going to actually break up those different phases prior to entering the room. Uh, once you're in the room, the experiences that people have, the kinds of rooms that, can, uh, that people can enter into and uh, how we can design the room to be as inclusive as possible. So let's start by talking about how do we get the right people in the room, right? So if you're asking yourself, what does it mean by the quote unquote right people? Um, we're talking about engaging diverse stakeholders, right? With a special focus on those who are most impacted, but historically least represented. Um, so only, you know, your community knows what that is for you. Um, and that can vary from district to district, from organization to organization. Um, but taking special time to be intentional, right? Um, in terms of who you're inviting into, the, um, into these decision-making moments and to your stakeholder engagement. Um, and, and secondly, this question of what are the things that are preventing um, you from getting these folks into the room and making sure that your stakeholder engagement strategy is truly inclusive. Um, so there are four barriers in particular that we've seen and we wanna share today um, to kind of kick off this conversation. The first is what um, we often refer to as the fragility of an invitation. And so this is about the nature of any invitation to engage with this work. Um, sometimes we have these tacit expectations of diverse populations when it comes to equity work. We might expect them to teach us, to guide us, to respond to all requests um, for advice or insight. And we expect emotional vulnerability, unlimited availability. Um, and if that expectation is not met, we may unknowingly place the onus on them or react punitively by not inviting them into the conversation again. So, you know, as an example, let me put it this way. Let's say you're putting together focus groups um, and you make a personal invitation to someone whose background is not currently represented in the focus group. And they let you know that, you know, uh, they're unavailable to attend. Will that be the last time that they get invited to share or to engage in this work? Will they be seen now as difficult or negligent or unwilling to help um, simply because they weren't available to be a part of it this one time? Um, will that consequently bar them from the figurative room? That's what we're getting at here. The second component revolves around intent. So here we're talking about your intentions when engaging stakeholders. Sometimes stakeholder engagement can be less about providing opportunities to co-lead, co-design, co-conspire even, and they function more as a touch point to hear, um, but not to listen, right? To appear, but not to really engage with people or to even check off a box and say that we made those connections, we reached out to those communities, um, but those communities were never truly intended to be equal stakeholders and co-conspirators in this work. And so your intent may not always be explicit, it may not always be clear, but with matters that are as personal as that of racial equity, intent becomes critical to the success of the work. People need to see that you're engaging with them because you truly want to hear and learn from them and their experiences. Um, and that your desire in the end is ultimately to redesign with them, not just for them. The third component revolves around the duration of your efforts. So there was a report in the American Psychological Association that found that short-term implicit, implicit bias trainings had little to no bearing on the long-term behavior. And if anything, they had a more impact on the short-term knowledge of the vocabulary uh, surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so in other words, short-term efforts um, and solutions produced surface level short-term results. And those who have been deeply impacted by racial inequity in your community, they're going to be invested in the nature of your efforts with respect to duration. So that's for both the engagement strategy and for the solutions that you're generating. Will there only be one opportunity to share, right? Before I was talking about one invitation, but perhaps there's multiple opportunities. Here we're talking about, is there just one opportunity? We're only gonna hold one town hall for all black and brown staff to share their experiences, or we're only gonna hold one interview slot for whichever parent can make it. What this is gonna communicate or what this has the potential to communicate is that one, there's an expectation of little to no substance to come from these engagement points. And or two, that there's no real intent to learn from the communities being invited to these endeavors. And so then when it comes time for solutions, 
Are you planning to address it through one training or one short-term plan? So duration plays a role in the morale, but it's also relevant to both the stakeholder engagement and the solutions that you're generating. Um, and then the fourth is about non-inclusive strategies. So inclusive decision-making is not just about including multiple voices. It's also about the strategies that you use for incorporating those diverse voices. So do you place an undue burden on those on the margins to generate all of your ideas and address all of your equity challenges, right? It's all placed on them to do that work. Or instead, do you limit their influence to, and their input to only address the areas that you're most comfortable with, right? Or even limit them to areas that you deem to be most appropriate for them to speak to, right? Um, that can show up in an interview by saying, well, this conversation is just focusing on this particular thing. And I, I don't want to derail us, but they might be bringing up something that hasn't been considered yet that ought to be considered, right? Um, these things may shape how you uh, craft a survey instrument, um, the language that you use when even extending an invitation, the way that you approach engaging stakeholders that accept that invitation, and ultimately what data and information you gather from the overall experience. Um, so I want to just encourage us to take a moment to pause and reflect. How have you not recognized these barriers in the past? Um, you know, and if so, what was the context and environment that prevented you from seeing some of these barriers? How might or um, how have you seen these barriers play out in current systemic practices in your particular environment? How might the invisible conditions be supporting barriers to inclusiveness? And if you feel so moved, feel free to drop a note in the chat to, to share out with the rest of the group. You know, we want to just encourage people to, to be brave and name some of the things that they're saying. So what does that look like for you? And I think there was a question about what the first one was, and that had to do with the fragility of an invitation, right? So um, only inviting people in once if they say that they're unavailable that one particular time. Jess, I really appreciate hearing you talk about this and I'm giving people time to share in the reflection and into the chat. Um, I'm gonna model some vulnerability and just like share some reflections that came out. Just, I've heard Jess talk about this, but I think once again, every time it just brings on a new perspective. Um, for, for the fragility of invitation, I can, it got me to a place of where I've experienced this barrier, but I've also enacted this barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and so the experience of this barrier is I've had um, really great leaders actually make comments to me, not maybe about me, but maybe about others that have actually stated in the past of like, oh, well, you know, I invited them, but they never, you know, responded or they didn't come. Like they, th this might not be a priority or it might not be a reality. And I think if I've I heard that over time, I started internalizing the idea of like, oh, like I have to respond or else it's showing that I don't care. And then like over, I, in the last few years, I'm still actively working on it. Um, it's like, what does it mean to actually not be what does it mean to be okay to like ensure that just because someone doesn't respond the first time doesn't mean that this isn't important to them maybe they don't feel the emotional safety maybe they're not in a space and maybe there isn't the trust there so i think that's where i felt it enacted and i think when i projected this barrier onto my parent population was when i was a, a building leader um came around the idea of like oh like you know we invited them, we make it an open invitation, but they don't come because, you know, they can't, they're a working parent, right? Or, you know, um, they they don't really come to events and, and, and maybe because we had a difficult conversation about a discipline or academic issue, like, ooh, maybe I don't wanna exert that. Um, so that's examples where I told myself stories. I might've not said it out loud and put it into the world, but it was definitely um, things that I placed barriers in inclusion. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And and even the way that you talk about the impact, I've, I've felt it too, that yeah. if I don't show up every time, then there's going to be this perception that I'm not willing to engage, that I don't want to engage, that I don't care as much about this work. Um, and also, if I've been one to name challenges before in other settings, and then an invitation comes and I don't show up, then it looks like I just want to be antagonizing the work when actually I'm truly committed to it, but there's a perception there or a pressure there to show up every time. And what does that do to create fatigue or um, undue pressure on those on the margins? 
So, you know, as, at a high level, you know, I just want to leave you all with a few tips before passing the mic. So, you know, one, be sure to avoid one time invitations or short term strategies. Instead, what I want you to focus on are multiple invitations, um, you know, multiple invitations and opportunities to engage. Um, avoid inviting diverse stakeholders to participate if you don't plan to truly engage them to listen to them and incorporate their feedback. And instead, plan to, you know, plan how you're going to document and codify the information shared, how you're going to incorporate it into your plans. Be intentional about those things beforehand. And then also allow the information to reveal new things to you and to evolve how you plan to incorporate it into your plans. And lastly, avoid non-inclusive strategies and expectations, those things that we were kind of sharing previously and instead prioritize those that are most impacted and least represented in the work. Invite them in, but don't place sole responsibility on them. Awesome, and thank you all for continuing to, to, to share out in the chat. I really appreciate it. And so that's the first part, which are, these are the barriers of designers. So you might be in a position where you're actually tasked with designing inclusive stakeholder engagement, right? Or your, your task is like, all right, we want to bring more inclusion within the voices of stakeholders, whether it's students, whether it's um, community members, parents, staff members. Um, so we sort of laid out the barriers of like, as you start actively designing those in experiences, what do you need to make sure you're actively mitigating against? And I'm gonna take Lacey Brandt, uh, Bryant, I think that's how you say your last name, Lacey Bryant's a reflection in the chat of like how, even though she's been learning from implicit bias trainings, like really taking the time to work on pausing and recognizing them, right? So that this is the exact, this is how you apply what Justice went through is how do you pause and recognize barriers um, in how you design these experiences? So now that you've designed it and you're like gonna go like, check, I'm actively pausing, I'm mitigating against these barriers. Now that you're bringing people into the room, right? So now like you're even successful, you're bringing people into this more um, equitable, inclusive room to get to hear their voices and really design this experience. The question we're asking is, why have well-meaning people with the desire to really break the systemic inequities in education and really include the voices of disfranchised not been able to create the changes needed. I will say more and more, we, we don't really hear, I'm not saying it doesn't exist because it does where people were like, oh, like maybe inadvertently talk about not needing to include certain voices. But more and more often we hear people recognize that they want to include voices and they design to include boy voices. But once in their, they're in the room, it doesn't really happen. And so these are the section that we call detours. So these are sort of the detours you need to spot once you're in the room. And here are two um, quotes uh, from Joan Olson that's really shaped our thinking. Um, the first one is that journey towards becoming a reconditioned and effective anti-racist, I have become aware of habits, attitudes, and attached behaviors, which divert me from my intended goals. And that in order to address systemic inequities of exclusion, you must begin to recognize those invisible and subconscious behaviors that are preventing you from believing new things about yourself, and more importantly, what inclusion can look like. So, so these are the aspects of our, our habits, our attached behaviors, our attitudes, the things that we've held on to maybe years and decades as best practices that have been taught to us by people we really admire and seen as great leaders. We need to start unconsciously unlearn and actively relearn. And this is probably one of the hardest aspects um, that I'm working on every day. I make mistakes, but I need people like him and Jessica and other teammates around me to like help me make this safe. And so the, the action, if you're looking for action is how do you actively start to unlearn and relearn processes so you can start to shift the limbs, the beliefs and the behaviors in order for you to challenge established notions. And so, Mo uh, mo modeling some vulnerability here are three areas that I've been working to unlearn and relearn for the last, I would say like seven to seven plus years. Um, and the first one for me for the longest time, um, I, I talked about fairness uh, in a school role in a district role. I talked about fairness a lot because I was really afraid that people will say that this is unfair. 
right? And, 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 and I had to relearn and unlearn, like, when is it appropriate to talk about equality? And when is it actually talking about equality hindering the ability to bring equity, right? So I'm constantly challenging myself of like, when is fairness or where is the equal approach right? And when is it actually not the right thing? Um, and that brings to the third one. I have really had to challenge and unlearn like right and best. Um, I am someone who really believe in learning. I, I love learning it and I look at great scholars and leaders and people around me and I try to learn from them, like their approach. And, and I think the thing that I've had to really question is I had to really re unlearn some things that I was taught as best approaches that actually aren't and come to that like emotional realization that I can do better now, but I might have caused harm, or I'm sorry, I caused harm. And so some of that learning and right is around, definitely around some of the, the cultural discipline practices that either I was told to enforce as a teacher or and or then I put in place at my school, even though my intentions were all the right intentions. And then the last one is the proof of concept, right? Do I challenge people to show me data in a very traditional, middle class normed way of like, what does it mean to show this actually is a truthful thing versus like, how do I actually just recognize that sometimes the proof of concept doesn't sit in the, 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 the data that I'm accustomed to seeing. And so all of these are things that you should actively start to, or not all, this is, these are the things that I'm working on and learning and relearning, because if I don't do this, I can't actually create equitable spaces for people to be included. And so just Kim and I sort of thought about what are the six detours that happens a lot once we're actually in a room, whether it's a um, empathy interview, a focus group, a town hall or et cetera. So here are the six and we're gonna like go in and into them like a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper with some quotes. So the first one is when you walk into a room and there's a detour of re people, re uh, sorry, the detour of rejecting both and, right? The second detour is about when people are making statements that are upholding the myth of meritocracy. The third detour that you should spot is definitely, I heard someone, I saw someone put it in the chat when there's like a few dominating voices that is taking over the conversation. Even if they're a part of the marginalized group, right? Like, so like we're saying like this, this is like, regardless of the fact if there's, this is just, if there's a dominating voice in the room. Four is when people are speaking on behalf or alluding to generalizations of other people's experiences. Five is seeking to acknowledge intent, right? So they're taking a lot of space of acknowledging intent. And one of the things that came to my mind finally click again when in just when she talked about um, intent is that people don't recognize intent just because you really state your intent. Intent is a result of historical interaction. Um, and so oftentimes we see people that are seeking to acknowledge intent in the moment, but know that there's so much in the back. And six is the inclusion feedback fatigue. And so what we want to do is we hope you could take a second and, and model some vulnerability. You could do it um, on your own paper, in your own reflection, or in the chat. Um, is we want you to think about how are these detours presented um, in your own system? How have they presented itself in your own system or within your own self? Um, so what we'll do is we'll go through a, uh, the, the detours and share some quotes that may represent these detours being like, like spotlighted and just be thinking, have you thought in any form of these? Have you heard any forms of these? And have you said any forms of these? So the ask is, we're about to share some quotes of, um, there's so many quotes, but we're just giving you the notion and then, then uh, take a second and be like, ooh, have you heard these in, in any form, uh, shape or form? And Jess and Kim, if you can interact too, maybe if you feel comfortable just share some vulnerability as well. So for the first detour about rejecting both and, um, this is when people are coming in and limiting their thinking. So it's like, it, it's, it's in a terms of like, it's either this or this, it can't be this both and place. And, and quotes that I've heard that is um, when there's only one truth and it's my truth, meaning I have not experienced that. Like I haven't seen that. I don't know if that's the case here, right? Um, or when you hear people only acknowledging one method as valid. So uh, a quote might be, uh, do we have a policy or a standard protocol for this? Because I, I think we have like an approach to this or refusing to challenge the historical context, right? It could be in the form of like, 
you know, this is just what we've always done. Like, this is just a part of like who we are and this is like our approach. So like, blank, 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 blank. These are examples of when people are actually rejecting the idea of both and, that there could be two truths at the same time. The second one for the upholding the myth of meritocracy is these are quotes when, um, when you hear, are we hoping, like we're really hoping we can lean on you to provide some perspective around insert challenge. And the person that is the you is the only person in the room that may represent the specific underrepresented community most being impacted. Because this comes from a place that like people are invited are brought in and then they're like, oh, like you can really help us understand because you are different, right? Or you've seen this, or um, this, is, this is your experience. So like bring it to like, we could really lean on your perspective. Or it's like, oh, we really trust you. You've really seen, you've really been here. You've seen the approach. You've seen how we've been approaching this work. And you're, you're not like, you know, people who are relatively new. So can you tell us your perspective, right? So it's, it's pinpointing to those people, individuals. The third detour is when there's a few dominating voices, and I think this really rec is, re, uh, you're, you recognize it. And one of the things that just we want to call out is um, this also means that it ex they might be trying to also re-explain people's concepts, right? So it's not just they're the dominant voice. Is that like once people share their thought, they're the ones who are like, oh, we're gonna repeat the idea, and I'm gonna try to explain to you what is racism, what is sexism, what are the other forms of oppression. Um, and they're not yet leaving the space for underrepresented voices, um, or they become the competing voice. Um, and you might hear people say like, oh, like, thank you, Jessica, for sharing. I've told, I, I want to second Jessica. I've heard that from this person that they also feel like that, right? Where like they become even more dominating voice because they're bringing in other perspectives um, that may not be their real experience or be overgeneralization. And that goes into the fourth one, right? Which is like speaking on behalf. So I think the two of them go hand in hand um, where there's a, there's a fine difference where um, people are, you know, speaking to elevate concepts, but they they might be actually trying to say like, oh, I've, I've talked to these people, like I've talked to these people or I've talked to this group and this is what they tell me. So let me share it. But then when they're asked the back of like, is that what you believe? They might say, oh, no, no, no. Like, I've never seen this. So like, I'm just telling you what other people are telling me, right? Um, and that one goes with the dominating voice of, you know, when, when, when people are just taking a lot of space, whether they're an external processor and they're just processing all their emotions in front of everyone and it's taking up time or they're actually speaking on behalf of people. Yeah, if I can hop in there, Crystal, yeah. I think I see that also come out in another interesting way, whereas um, someone might ask a stakeholder to speak on behalf of the community and, you know, be their representative. Tell me what, you know, your community, the whole thing. So you can ask people about their personal experiences. Um, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the voice of all experiences and there are a diversity of experiences in all community groups. So I think I see that coming from both hands, right? Someone speaking on behalf of um, their community or others seeking to find sort of the community representative per se and expecting that they are going to be the, you know, singular voice that's going to give that insight into their community. Yes, um, and even as you were speaking about <clears throat> the myth of meritocracy, it made me think about how there have been times where um, I've been that person in the room, expected to speak on behalf of a community, um, and also rejoiced or celebrated in some way. Um, and it almost undercut the nature of my experience there, mm -hmm. because if, if the value that I bring is that I'm more trustworthy than this group um, that I, I, in theory, represent, or that somehow I'm unlike them. Perhaps I've uh, uh, had more success in, in ways that you might have defined it compared to this other group. Then how does that make me feel when going back to the rest of that group in that community? Is there even a, a potential perception of me as someone who who now is, is uh, maybe even perceived as a traitor, if you will? Um, and, and how does that then make me question every opportunity that I'm given, um, every accolade I receive? Now there's this sort of undertone of, 
well, you're receiving this opportunity to engage with us because you're not like these other folks, not because of, you know, the nature of the relationship you have with us, or because we just truly value what you have to say. It's always, it, when it's relative to other things, it really harms uh, the trust that you can potentially have going into those engagements. Thanks, Jess. I, I'm always like getting new perspective. And I, I don't know if um, our, our friends who are joining us getting this feeling, um, it's a feeling of like, there's so much to do, right? There's so much like how everything is connected together and just know that that is okay to feel that. And, and this is a goal. We're not saying this is an easy destination and, and this is a constant process of learning to recognize and being better. And no one is like the perfect good person at inclusion because it's not about being the final like checkbox. It's about the constant relearning and learning process. And you're hearing Kim and Jess and I reflecting ourselves in the moment, even though like we sit with this content pretty frequently. Um, the, the fifth one is one that we often hear is around seeking to acknowledge intent. So next time you walk into a, a feedback meeting or a brainstorm or a focus group or anything, be on the lookout of how much time people are using to recognize the intent of leaders that may not even be in the room, the intent of the system, the intent of someone else's comment or the intent of the outcomes. And that may come in the form of these quotes. So have you heard these? Um, I know that's not what you mean, right? I, I know this is not what you mean. I know that's not your intent, but we know, insert this person, this leader, the system, this procedure, um, they really care about kids, right? So that it can't like that their intent is not that they really care about kids. So like it's it's not about them. And then ne the next one is um, they're a really good person. They would never intentionally do harm to anyone right? Or they, they don't want to do harm to the community. What we're saying about it is when you're sitting in a space that is about a focus group, a, a feedback conversation, if people feel the need to constantly recognize intent, it might be a sense for you that there is a distrust or an emotional um, safety that has been breached where people need to be, be told, you're a good person, your intent is good, I know you're a good person, before even jumping into the meat of the actual conversation. And so be timing. How much time do people spend on recognizing intent versus actually getting into the conversation? And finally, the sixth one is about inclusion feedback fatigue. And so this is when uh, you want to be on a lookout because if it's constantly the same person being called on, if it's the same person speaking up first, if it's the same people to try to like help people understand the culture and the leadership and the policies and how it can be more equitable and inclusive, they're at one point probably exhausted. You might see it in the moment, you might see it after the fact, and you might see it in their lack of attendance of willing to come for future interactions. Um, and so quotes that may, you know, you might hear might be from your teammates saying like, oh, we should really ask, insert parent or parent group. They're always willing to come to school and they're always willing to help. And, you know, they have really great perspective. But if that comes up all the time, that is a sign of uh, inclusion feedback fatigue, especially if that parent or that group um, is representing a marginalized community, because that also then corresponds with the myth of meritocracy. Um, the next one, it might be like, oh, you know, we should really think about this one parent. We should just call them up. Like they, they would know, they have the perspective of all the parents, but if they're the ones you're calling every single time, then it's time to question like, are they feeling the fatigue of having to represent the voice? So those are your six detours. Here are some things for you to actions to reject and actions to take, right? So actions you can start doing is if you're the facilitator of a conversation of inclusion conversation, do not allow dominance of a conversation. Interrupt. I think this is something I've had to learn. Like we've learned, don't interrupt, like let them finish. But sometimes when it takes them 10 minutes to finish, people are looking to you to maintain the safety of the group. So you do need to interrupt and you need to take that action. But what you could do proactively at the front end, you just need to name the, the detour, right? Like we don't want to, we want to make sure there's no dominance of one voice. We want to make sure that this is an expectation. 
And then you need to say, when I feel like we, we need to, like as a facilitator, I will interrupt the conversation. The second action to reject is um, invite the same people to engagement or actually not explicitly having one-on-one -on -one reach outs for an in explicit invitation. And in, this one sort of goes with like, we'll post it on Facebook, right? And whoever can come will come. Well, the people who can come are probably the ones who've been benefiting from the system and who've like actually gotten their voice heard. Actions then to take is cold call, leave space, have silence, interrupt, like allow these different aspects of invitations, a cold call up and like I and, and recognizing that your intent, you know, your historical experience, not recognizing your intent, but your historical interactions, you might not have met the inc equitable inclusion and you're working and naming what you're working on as your new sort of why you're cold calling them to come and having that one-on-one -on -one invitation. Last one, reject when people are generalizing experiences. Oftentimes we're told to synthesize and summarize, but oftentimes what can happen is people are in a space and they start generalizing other people's experiences that then actually do not actually capture the truth, which oftentimes is used to like feed this both and, right? Or like in, in either or thinking. So what you need to do is you need to frame some questions around impact and not intent at the very beginning. So people do not feel the need to generalize and name that we're not synthesizing in the moment. These are just some quick things to take as you think about detours and in the moment practices. All right, and I'm going to um, spend a little time talking about the different types of rooms um, that you might invite your stakeholders into, thinking about things like how you can design these rooms to amplify and invite underrepresented voices. What do they look like? What are some of the best um, strategies? I'm going to go through them quickly just to highlight some, but encourage you to dive into our actual um, include guide to really get to know a bit more about how to design these rooms. Um, so first, uh, I'll talk a bit about a focused group. Um, this might be the one that you all are most familiar with, but this is a really facilitated group where you're bringing together a small group that's been intentionally designed um, to bring together uh, cohorts with similarities with specific questions. Um, and usually the intent is you want to kind of get a narrative response to really understand their experiences, as opposed to something like a survey where it's sort of short answer. So you're really asking open-ended questions that are going to facilitate a, a really in-depth and, um, and uh, narrative uh, communication strategy there. Um, I think this one is really helpful when you are just trying to really get an understanding of the community needs um, and stakeholder needs. This really helps kind of uncover some of those trends um, that might be harder to pull out in something um, as uh, something that might be more direct um, in a survey as opposed to having this open-ended discussion. Um, so that's one um, opportunity. Another one is an in-depth interview. So this is similar um, in, ten, in terms of having that sort of narrative response where you're really asking open-ended questions um, and understanding personal experience, but the key difference is this is going to be a one-to-one -one experience. Um, we always recommend in-depth interviews if you're asking questions that might be uh, a little bit less comfortable for um, people to share in a group format. Um, so perhaps you really do want to understand a uh, narrative experience, but you're asking questions that could be sensitive and people might be challenged sharing that in a um, group setting. So you might use the in-depth interview in that approach. Um, but both of these are really helpful to help uncover some of those trends that might be, um, or, or experiences that might be shared among similar cohorts. All right, um, and so next I'll talk a bit about town halls. So this is gonna be really a broader open space where you're inviting community members to share their thoughts. Um, sometimes it might just be an open forum where people are invited to share thoughts on anything and everything that they will have feedback on. There might be specific things that you want feedback on. So perhaps um, you have a new uh, proposal or idea, um, something that you wanna bring to the community and have um, the space for people to share. And this is really an, an area where setting norms and ex expectations is gonna be really helpful. So Crystal talked about some of these things um, already, but you really want to have ground rules in terms of speaking time, sharing the floor, making sure everyone feels invited to share their thoughts. Um, so then it feels kind of more engaged and inviting as opposed to allowing some of those more dominant um, and active voices to kind of steer that um, town hall experience. Um, and then empathy interviews. So that's actually similar to the um, in-depth interview experience with uh, a difference being that it's 
more similar to a town hall in the sense that you're going to ask for feedback on specific things. Um, so again, it might be kind of, you might think of it as like a user experience um, type of survey, um, something kind of similar to what would happen in a market research environment where you have a specific idea um, program that you want to get feedback on. And so you will ask someone to interact with that and then provide their feedback on the experience. All right, um, and then so student, um, so these are both ways to kind of understand. Um, it, it's kind of, I think of this as a way of like walking a mile in their shoes, really, um, where you're actually kind of stepping into the experience um, of community members. So when you're doing a shadowing, um, you might spend a period of time with a student or a family and just kind of go through their day to day and see what their experience is like, what are some of their lived experiences. What is really interesting in this experience is there might be challenges um, in a student's day-to-day -day life that maybe um, impacts them, but they might not even, it may be such a commonplace experience that only an outside observer um, might be able to notice that. And you might have ideas and solutions to kind of um, Im improve that experience or find a way to um, support a student in a way that you can offer. Um, so I think that's a really useful way just to kind of like dive into what their day-to-day -day lived experience is like. Um, and then community walk. Um, so again, that's similar, but that's gonna be more of just kind of taking time to experience a variety of settings in different communities. So it could be a neighborhood walk. It could even be, you know, hanging out in lunchtime um, discussions to kind of understand, um, you know, what are some of the things that are important to your stakeholders um, in, you know, lunchtime, it might be students. What are they talking about? What are things that matter to them? Um, but the key thing, um, with this one is really just kind of building up the rapport in advance. So, you know, it's not about just sort of showing up and saying, all right, I'm here and I'm just going to kind of, you know, dive into your personal life and experiences, but really kind of building up a relationship to, um, you know, have that sort of psychological safety and ensuring that you are welcome to um, interact with the community and engage in a way that helps you understand their experiences. All right, um, and then so targeted survey, um, I think this is something that all of you are probably familiar with, um, but this is a way to um, kind of understand um, some trends um, across stakeholder groups. We use the word targeted because I think um, oftentimes surveys um, and districts are kind of sent to all stakeholders, whereas you can have a targeted survey where you think a little bit more specifically about communities and experiences that, um, that you might want to dive a little bit deeper into. So for example, um, you know, maybe you want to know a little bit more about the experience experiences of parents of students in special education or in a specific program or something of that nature. And so I think there's really an opportunity to design more personalized experience to really get a little bit deeper as opposed to we're going to send out the survey to everyone that's not going to be as helpful in designing more personal experiences. Um, and then so a bulletin board is similar to a survey um, in the sense that you know, it's often in an online format, but one of the key shifts with that um, is that it's a little bit more interactive. So this might be something that you're less familiar with. I haven't seen it as common um, in schools. I have seen it quite a bit in market research, um, a world that I worked in in, in another life, um, but it's a way to kind of have a little bit more of an uh, engaging interaction. So you might have a question that you post and then you have a cohort that you um, invited and um, designed the bulletin board for, and then you're following up with these different questions and having a really interactive experience. Um, the One of the really great benefits of this is people can respond at their own time in a place that feels more comfortable to them as opposed to something, um, you know, like a focus group where they have to be there at a specific time, um, which we'll talk about in a minute about how to design um, around timings that feel more comfortable. But with a bulletin board, you can kind of have a little more flexibility there. Um, so I talked through those quickly. I know those are lots of examples. So in, you, you know, certainly need some processing time, but again, we go into all of those a lot more in depth in our include guides. Um, all right, and so um, here I want to highlight some um, best practices in crafting your room. Um, we, we call them best practices here, but I think really it should be called essential practices. I think, you know, with you really want to keep all of these things in mind when you're thinking about how to not just design the room, but how to really leverage the insights um, that you gather in a way that's going to be meaningful and useful um, and provide the insights that are really going to help you understand your community's needs. Um, so I'll just highlight a few of these. So the first one I'll talk about is analysis. Um, one of the biggest mistakes we see in stakeholder engagement is you put all this work into um, you know, crafting the questions for the focus group, arranging the time and the logistics and hearing everyone's voice. And then you kind of stop there, right? And say, great, my work is done. I you know, brought everyone here and I heard their voice and I understand their needs. 
Uh, one of the things though that is really important in this type of research is I'm just recognizing that sometimes personal bias comes into play in ways that you might not even recognize. Um, so you may think, well, I heard this a lot and that really resonated, but maybe you're just hearing things that piqued your interest because it's personally interesting to you. Maybe you missed some things that were actually really underlying trends that were really important, but you just didn't hear it as much because it wasn't something that felt as relevant to you. And that happens um, even to the best of researchers, people who are trained in qualitative research and focus groups, it happens to all of us. Um, so really taking that time, and it, this isn't just applicable to focus groups, you know, across all the different types of rooms, but actually to really take a step back and analyze and, you know, read through all the notes and review your transcripts and really understand the trends, um, you know, even getting to the level, if you can, of actually doing the, you know, textual coding to really understand what were the trends that really emerged, what was the, um, you know, depth of this trend across different groups, even if you can get into more nuanced across different demographic analysis. Um, so, and that's something that I always really push for, um, you know, cause I have that research background is just really taking the time to do that research. Cause if you don't do that research then you may just be um, kind of putting all of that hard work and designing the room to waste if you don't take the time for that. All right, and then we have just a little bit of time. So I'm gonna go a little bit quicker through these next couple um, of examples. But so setting specific agreements. So we really wanna uh, make sure that everyone understands the expectations for engagement. Um, so just a quick example in focus groups, I always set the um, ground rule that all experiences are valid and this is not a space for debate. So sometimes what happens in a focus group is someone might share an experience and then a person might feel that that experience doesn't res resonate with them. And they may say, well, I don't think that's true. Or, you know, I don't, I haven't seen that in my life. And really you want to discourage that before it even happens and say, you know, we're not going to invalidate anyone, anyone's experiences. All experiences are valid. So people feel continually invited to share their thoughts. All right, um, and then scheduling for others. So this is a key one. I think often, you know, when we're thinking about how we're going to schedule engagements, the starting point is what's the best time for my team? When can I be there? When can my colleagues be there? Um, but if you're designing experience that's intended to invite your community into the room, you really wanna think about what their needs are. Do you have a commuter community where people maybe need to have something later in the evening because they're gonna be you know, spending time driving home from work or maybe there are lots of people working different shifts in your community. So think about you know, what are the times that are gonna be most convenient for your stakeholders as opposed to what are the times that are gonna be most convenient for you? The intent is you wanna make this a space where they feel invited and they feel welcome and timing is just one of those really key steps early on that you can um, consider to make sure that they do feel invited. And so with that, um, keep on following us. Let us know if you're if you have any questions about this. I think this is all stuff that we're super passionate about, and there's a lot more detours. Um, definitely check out the guide, and there will be one pagers coming out shortly um, around each of these different types of engagement strategies. Um, yes, and Jessica has just dropped actually the guide directly into the chat, um, and so know that you're not alone in this uh feel free to reach out to us as you're as you're going through it i know i learn a lot from my colleagues every day around how to you know relearn and unlearn and do better um so the question now is join us next time march 4th at 11 o'clock eastern for part three of our methodology which is about equitable creation so now that you've engaged you've included voices how do you actually redesign and create prototypes to change systems um, and then the question is, Kim, what are you currently working on? Jessica, what are you currently working on? Um, will you guys share what's top of mind? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I have a series called Tea Time with Jess, where I share in 10 minutes or less major topics around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, the latest episode that's going to come out actually tackles some of these topics. And Crystal's a guest uh, uh, on, on the episode. So uh, be sure to check out um, all of those different videos on YouTube um, if you go to youtube.com slash education elements. And what are you working on? Yeah, well, something that I think is actually pretty relevant to this that I'm working on is um, a community um, engagement inventory to really help um, districts understand how have they been engaging, what's been useful, what's not useful, and what are ways that they can really take some of um, these ideas to the next level to really understand um, their community's needs in a um, more uh, direct and um, inviting way. So yeah, really excited to kind of um, develop this community engagement tool. Love. And I'm with similar with Kim. Uh, we're working on the inventory phase of our methodology. I'm currently working on an inventory of a school systems academic uh, pro, uh, 
system of how do we redesign academic systems for, to be more equitable for students, as well as a culture one. So uh, continue following us. Let's reconnect and hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank you everyone for joining us.